I'm sorry? I'm going to whip them into shape. All right, so Jim just said you used to teach, get the class in order. More importantly, I raised 18 boys, so I will start screaming. <laughs> People don't sit down. Thanks. <laughs> and they were all teenagers at the same time. I did not give birth to 18 boys. <laughs> just two. Great, thanks so much. Um, I'm Diane Jones, and um, I am grateful to have been asked to moderate this panel on a topic that is near and dear to my heart um, about the Federal Student Loan Program. Um, we have a panel here of the, you know, the brain trust in the Student Loan Program and in thinking about higher ed costs, meaning from this side of the table over. I've been a practitioner of the programs. These are the great minds, the great thinkers about these programs. And so it's really awesome <laughs> to bring them all together um, to talk about a program where, you know, there is bipartisan agreement that it's a disaster. So I think that's a really good starting point. It's the one thing that both parties can agree on is that the program's a disaster. Where there's disagreement is how to fix it. And I think that the folks on this panel will share some great ideas with you, talk about some of the limitations of those panels. Um, so I'm going to just briefly introduce everybody. I'm going to make a few opening remarks, and then we'll let the smart people talk. Um, so uh, we have Todd's wiki. Um, Todd is a senior, um, I'm sorry, Todd is a professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. So I think the only lawyer on the panel, is that correct? Um, next, we have uh, Beth Akers. Uh, Beth and I have known each other forever. Beth is now at the American Enterprise Institute, and she spends a lot of time thinking about, you know, loans and college costs and things of that nature. Uh, Preston Cooper, who I met when he was at AEI, um, and is now a senior fellow at the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity. And then Matt Chinkos, who was my colleague at the Urban Institute when I worked there many years ago, he remains. Uh, at the Urban Institute and just is amazing at looking at data and really digging into the data and understanding what it means. So we're really lucky to have these four with us today. Uh, my job is to give you the three minute overview of the federal student loan programs and how they work. I'm gonna start by asking, has anybody in this room ever taken a federal student loan? Okay, me too. It's more complicated than a car loan. It's more complicated than a mortgage. And by the way, the Department of Education will make those loans to 16-year-olds without their parents' signature. That tells you everything you need to know about the program. It is a disaster. I'm going to talk about the four main programs that are in the portfolio as it exists today uh, for the federal student loan program. The first is the FEL loan program, the Federal Family Education Loan Program. Some people call it FEL, some people call it FELP. You may hear people refer to that program during this, this, this conversation this morning. The FELP program was, for many years, the primary program through which students could borrow. It was a bank-based, government-guaranteed loan program. So real banks that really know how to handle money and make loans were the ones who made them and serviced them. But because these were high-risk loans, the government came in and paid subsidies annually, guaranteed a certain return on interest, and also reimbursed lenders when loans went into default and they were unrecoverable. So the great thing about the FELT program was that people who know banking ran it. Because it was run by bankers, um, they understood things like variable interest rates to try to reward creditworthy borrowers. In the FELL lending program, the lenders could reduce origination fees, they could reduce interest rates, and so there was an ability for borrowers, most borrowers, to shop around. You could look at several different lenders and pick the program that was right for you. And up until around 2008, and I'll talk about why in a minute, 
about 80% of the student loans were in the FELT program. Now, it was the decision of the college, whether it participated in FELP or the other program I'm going to talk about. So once you picked the college, you were told whether it was FELP or, D or direct loan. But if it was a FELP college, then you could pick your lender. And the FELP program was mostly of interest to colleges that could attract lenders because they had moderate risk among their student population. For the most part, the next program that came along, the direct loan program created in 92, only about 20% of the loans were made in that program, at least until 2008. And that program was oftentimes thought of like a lender of last resort when schools could not attract lenders because they had an extremely high risk student population. They often relied on the direct loan program. So I'm gonna talk about the direct loan program. That program was created in 1992. It is a government run government service loan program, meaning the government is the bank. Here's problem number one. The Department of Education's Federal Student Aid Office was built to be a guarantee agency, not a bank. They are now a bank, and they're a bad one. But you can see how in time, the purpose of federal student aid changed considerably, as did their responsibilities. We now have a situation where, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, there is no more FELP program, although there are still FELP loans being serviced. Now everybody is pushed into the direct loan program. In that program, Congress establishes the origination fee, Congress establishes the interest rate, and they do it roughly every, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. So these are not market-based interest rates. And what you have to understand, what I didn't understand about this program until I came to Washington is, when, decision, when policy decisions are made by Congress on the student loan program, it has nothing to do with what students need to, be, to succeed. It's a mathematical calculation. Congress decides about how much money they think they can spend, and then they work backwards to figure out about how many loans they could make. And furthermore, in the last two decades, the student loan program has been seen as a way to pay for other things that Congress wants to do. So we now use the interest in fees paid by students on their student loans to fund various other things. So it's a revenue raiser. So Congress knows and uses this program as a revenue raiser, well at least that's what they thought it was, um, and as a vote getter. Because while nobody wants to pay their loans back, they all want them on the front end. So we now have a situation where the government is the lender, it is the servicer. And because the government wasn't set up to be a servicer for some period of time, although it's shifting now, they had nine different contractors who served as loan servicers. Without centralized data systems, um, you know, the data system was programmed in COBOL, which I took COBOL programming like in 1986. So, you know, it's very outdated. So those are the two main programs for undergraduate students. There are loan limits. The first year a student can borrow $5,500 unless they are independent or have a parent who can't qualify for a PLUS loan, and then they can borrow $9,500. In the second year, they can borrow a little more. The maximum is 6,500 for dependent students, 10,500 for independent students, and so on and so forth. The maximum amount that a dependent student can borrow through the direct loan program today is $31,000. So when you hear about $80,000 of debt, $90,000 worth of debt, it is not an undergraduate student. They cannot accumulate that much federal debt. They might have private loan debt, but they cannot. Who can? Their parent. And we heard a little bit about the parent plus loans. In the early 90s, the cap was lifted on parent plus loans so that a parent can borrow up to the cost of attendance. And their credit worthiness for this borrowing is based really on whether they're more than 80 or 180 days late on certain payments. There is no consideration of their income. So somebody making 35,000 a year 
who puts three kids through college could find themselves $300,000 in debt on Parent PLUS loans. But nobody ever considered their income, just if they're not delinquent on a mortgage um, or medical bills. For graduate students, um, I'm sorry, and, and so that's dependent students. Independent students can borrow more. Their cap is up to 57,000 for undergraduate loans. It's the lifetime cap. So you'll oftentimes hear people talk about schools that serve lower income students as these dreadful, horrible places because look up how much more lending their students do. Duh, because their students are largely either independent or they have parents who don't qualify for the PLUS loan program and therefore they have higher borrowing limits, $57,000. So when you are a school serving lower income students, they are gonna have higher debt. They don't have parents who had a 529, they often don't have parents supporting them along the way, and the federal government sets higher borrowing limits for them. If you are a graduate student, the cap on uh, the DL program is 138,500. But the caveat there is when you run out, and that includes however much you borrowed in your undergraduate, so it's an aggregate total. But that's okay because when you exceed that, have we got a deal for you? We've got a graduate plus loan, um, which I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is at the really nice interest rate today of 7.5%. So that's how people can get themselves buried into debt. How do they get themselves out of it? Well, the story only gets worse. If you are in repayment on a student loan, here are your choices for repayment. Standard repayment over 10 years, graduated repayment over 10 to 30 years, extended repayment over 10 to 30 years, income contingent repayment, income based repayment, income sensitive repayment, pay, repay, public service loan forgiveness, not to mention other programs that are specially focused on teachers or nurses or whatever. And to pick the right program, you at the ripe old age of potentially 22, have to be able to project your income into the next 20 years so that you pick the right program or you will find that at the end of 20 years, not only are you not gonna get your loan forgiven, but you have paid tens of thousands of dollars in interest, which means you have actually paid far more than you would have paid into the program under the standard 10-year repayment if there is anything left to forgive, you've still paid all that interest. Oh, and by the way, whatever is forgiven is treated as taxable income in the year in which it's forgiven. This is the part that most people are unprepared for. We haven't hit the 20 year mark on most of these programs. It's coming and people are gonna be shocked when they have to pay tax, income tax on $150,000 worth of forgiven student loans. So repaying is really a problem. And I'm just gonna conclude by saying there are a couple of landmark um, changes in the program that I think have put us in the situation we are in today where we, it's a disaster. You know, first was removing the caps on the PLUS loans. Although I have to say, if you are a low income person, as I was, and you want to go to graduate school, you can't do it without a limitless grad PLUS loan. This I learned because I was in medical school when the HEAL loan program was suspended thanks to the Grand Rudman Act. I did not get the next $13,000 of my loan and I was out of medical school, even though I was in the top 10 of my class. So uh, that's always in the back of my mind that you know theoretically we can come up with all of these great ideas, but when you're talking about real people losing access to those loans, has a real impact on their life. I mean, don't cry for me, I've had a good life, but I was two years into medical school and still had to pay those loans back. I think the next biggest problem with the program is the master promissory note. So imagine this, you go to CarMax and you buy a car, it shows up in your driveway, you signed for it. Then every year for the next four or five years, somebody parks a new car down the street in your neighbor's driveway, you don't really know, and then they send you a bill that says, by the way, you've bought a car every year for the last five years. This is what the master promissory note is. A student signs a document, usually the week before they start college, at the ripe old age of 18 for most students, 
And when they do that, oftentimes through an electronic signature, they are basically telling the school and the government, you can issue me the maximum amount of loan money without an additional signature on my part for the next 10 years. And people say, well, but the student knows they got the money. Not necessarily, because it goes to the school, and many schools have financial aid award letters that talk about loans as aid. And so many of those students legitimately believe they got student aid, and then they find out after the fact that that aid was a loan that they didn't sign for because they signed one master promissory note. So I think, you know, that's a problem. Um, in 2007, we had the College Cost Reduction and Access Act, created public service loan forgiveness and income-based repayment with the caveat that only direct loan borrowers could participate, fell borrowers could consolidate into the program. Um, then in 2010, you have the Affordable Care Act. We get rid of the FELL program. It's a government takeover of the program. And thank you, poor students, who are going to pay twice as much to go to college as rich students. On your backs, we're going to fund all of this additional health insurance and health care access. So we relied on our lowest income students to subsidize the expansion of, of health insurance. Finally, you know, we have COVID in 2020. Um, we have to create a loan holiday, you know, it's March 2020, nobody knows what this is, nobody knows where it's going, but now two and a half years later, we're still on a loan holiday, only to be told that now these loans might be forgiven. Um, and I'm sure others will talk about that. So we are now in a situation where we have about $1.8 trillion in the debt, maybe that number is a little bit wrong, but it's in that neighborhood, and there's a conversation about forgiving a substantial amount of that, um, which means that the taxpayers will, will pay. So it's a disaster. I'm sure we'll talk today about the legal authority that the president does or does not have to forgive these student loans. But the picture that I've presented to you um, should make you really scared <laughs> because 1.8, 1.9 trillion dollars is a lot of money. And the executive order signed by the president, not only does it forgive tons of the loans that exist, it creates a new income-based repayment program that probably will have a bigger financial impact on our country than even our current loan forgiveness. So I've now introduced you to the wonderful world of federal student loans. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Todd. Great, thanks. And I'm, I'm going to be a bit pell-mell here because I'm going to throw a lot of data in overview to you. Trust me, I've got sources to back it all up if you want to talk about it in discussion, but I've got about five minutes, but I did want to just briefly acknowledge that at a program on education law, uh, a policy in education, I just wanted to um, acknowledge Ken Starr, uh, who is a friend to many of us here and a great educator um, and a great loss. Um, I'm gonna, I've basically got two themes I want, uh, want you to take away with, and I'm going to uh, uh, provide some details on us. Which, this, which is, first, that pretty much everything you probably think you know about student loans is probably wrong. Um, and second, that where we are today is the result of unintended consequences of well-intentioned reforms in the past, and every single proposal on the table today is going to have unintended consequences uh, that we need to take account of in trying to reform this, including some of the favorites of probably some people in this room, so, uh, um, and conservatives uh, generally. So uh, let's start with the obvious point. Um, student loans are very large. It's the second largest uh, tranche on uh, household uh, balance sheets these days after mortgages. As Diane said, it's about 1.8 trillion, far larger. Now it's larger than both credit card and car loan debt put together, which is a lot of uh, debt. Why have student loans gone up? Because college costs have gone up, duh. Um, why have college costs gone up? Uh, there's a lot of theories. I could go through all of them, but the bottom line is that the data now indicates the reason college costs have gone up is because of subsidies uh, from the government. The New York Fed study on this is, I think, the gold standard. It says that about 65 cents of every dollar in increased financial subsidies uh, go directly into the pockets of the universities and higher tuition costs. 
There's other things that uh, provide some of the rounding errors, but that's basically what's going on. Why are college costs going up? Because we basically turned the education system into the healthcare system. Uh, we've basically turned into a third party payer system that uh, dampens price signals uh, to consumers, and now we're doing that even more. Uh, and and let's, not, let's not kid ourselves, uh, this jubilee that uh, Biden has announced is not a mystery to anybody. Uh, people have been acting for years now as if they're expecting this to happen, and just like good Wall Street investment bankers, uh, we created a moral hazard problem that people are responding to. Uh, so costs are going up. Where are the costs going? Two factors, bureaucrats and buildings bureaucrats and buildings. The percentage of money going into the classroom is not increasing over time. It's going to more and more bureaucrats and more and more buildings. We know what the buildings are. They're these fancy dorms, rec centers, uh, the arms race of uh, nicer. Uh, uh, now we're up, we're beyond climbing walls and we're into um, uh, aquatic centers and lazy rivers. Um, who knows uh, what's gonna be coming next. With respect to bureaucrats, I often think about uh, the time, perhaps apocryphally, when uh, John F. Kennedy visited Pope John the 23rd in the Vatican. Um, and he said, how many people work in the Vatican? And the Pope said, about half. Um, <laughs> uh, and that, and we really, there, we know bureaucrats have reproduced. Uh, my joke is one bureaucrat does work, two bureaucrats hold meetings and hire a third one to do the work. We literally do not know what these bureaucrats do. We just know that there's a lot more of them than there ever were before. So we know why costs are going up. We know why loans are going up. What's going on with defaults? Well, it turns out this is one of the things you probably don't know, which is first that the most common defaulters are low balance, not high balance. Why? Because high balance, uh, people with high student loan balances are also people with high incomes, usually because they've either graduated from school or they have a graduate degree. What predicts default? The two things that predict default are demographics and whether you finish your course of study. Demographics are things like age, whether you have children when you go to school, whether from your low-income background, race, uh, and the like. Um, uh, now, of course, that's correlated with completing your degree. So what is the problem? The problem are people who go to, who probably shouldn't have gone to college in the first place, go to two or three, two or three semesters of directional state university, get a student loan, get in debt, but they don't get the wage increase that you get if you uh, graduate. As my, my colleague at George Mason, Brian Kaplan says, the best investment you will ever make in your life is going to just the fourth year of college. Uh, the first three years are largely useless. It's not until you walk out with a degree that you really get much of a value from, uh, uh, from college. Um, and so low balances are correlated with default. High balances are not correlated with default. They're inversely correlated uh, precisely because high, high balance means high income and you've completed your degree probably from a selective school. What else does that mean? The type of school you attend does not appear to be correlated with default which is once you control for student quality and demographics, for example, there is no indication, for example, that for-profit schools um, uh, graduates are more likely to default than community colleges because community college students and for-profit students are more or less the, uh, uh, the, the same students. What predicts if you go to a selective school and you graduate, you will not default. What does that mean? The problem is not too many women's studies majors from Swarthmore, folks. Uh, those people, if they want to, they can get a job. They're smart, they're capable, they've graduated from Swarthmore or whatever selective college, but uh, maybe they don't want to work, but they can work, and if they have to repay their student loans, usually they find some way to get a job. Um, and, so, and, so, uh, and so that's the problem we're dealing with, right? Are uh, these, this large group of people who, this group of people who have relatively low student balances are dem in a certain demographic categories and haven't completed the degrees, and of course their degree completion is correlated with their demographics. So let's talk about proposed reforms and unintended consequences in a minute or so. There are three basic reforms on the table. One would be to allow dischargeability of student loans and bankruptcy. The second is basically some sort of student loan jubilee, like we're talking about right now. The third would be to try to somehow make the universities responsible for their lost positions. Now, here's the golden rule of higher education. Think about whatever the most pathological, selfish, debased, dishonest thing you could think that somebody would do and assume that that's what the universities will do. Uh, we're talking about institutions that shut their doors for 18 months and didn't give students a dollar of tuition rebates, right? This is the kind of people we're talking about who run universities today. They're the kind of people that make investment bankers blush. 
uh, with their degree of, uh, of ethics, right? So crank that through the system, we're already seeing it happen, right? Which is first, what happens if we allow uh, bankruptcy? Now, that is a huge benefit to people who have large student loan debts. I tell my students when I teach bankruptcy, the day you walk out of law school, you are highly insolvent, and perhaps the best investment you would ever make in your life is to file bankruptcy. If you have student loans, $80,000, $100,000 with the student loans for graduate school, you have no income, you have no assets, it's a winner, uh, right, to file bankruptcy. I think it's naive to think that bankruptcy wouldn't create a moral hazard for students, as well as universities who will just jack up uh, uh, tuition, and people will respond by borrowing more and saving less before they go to school. It just will happen. Same with the student loan jubilee, right? We know what's going to happen with the student loan jubilee. It's just another subsidy for higher education, and we need to keep in mind the higher education industry is a really big financial interest uh, for the Democratic Party, not just an intellectual interest, right, that they're propagandizing, but the single largest donor by employer to Barack Obama's presidential campaign was the University of California system. Uh, I believe uh, Goldman Sachs or Google was second, Harvard employees were third. I think seven out of the top 12 or 15 donors to Barack Obama's presidential campaigns were affiliated with universities. There is a lot of money and a lot of very wealthy people who are very politically active. And this is a powerful political force, not to mention the ideological value of it. Um, and so the Jubilee is on the table and it's going to have the same effects. Let's talk briefly as my last comment, and I've gone too long, but the conservative darling, which is to put universities in the first loss position. What is going to happen if we tell universities they're going to be responsible for the defaults of their students? They are not going to improve the quality of their education. That is not going to happen. What are they going to do? They're going to simply stop admitting students in these demographic categories who are most likely to default. The fastest growing college sport in America is men's lacrosse. Do you know why? Because men's lacrosse players come from high income, white suburbs, and their parents pay sticker price for college. Right? That's the kind of people we're talking about who run universities. They will simply stop admitting these at-risk students, and those are the people for whom exactly the student loan program is intended. First-generation college students from low-income backgrounds, uh, racially uh, uh, minorities, and that sort of thing. And so we should be very careful about that, and we should understand how the universities are going to respond to this. Thanks. Beth, we'll turn it to you. My turn. So I think both of my fellow panelists here went over time, if we're being you know, fair and strict here. <laughs> but I'm going to allow it because <laughs> they both gave an incredibly dense and impressive summary of this space. Um, but I promise to be fluffy and light to allow your brain to absorb all of those important details that you were just given. Um, I've been studying higher education finance for about 15 years now. And what I want to do is talk to you about the current moment. And that really is the past three and a half weeks, or maybe we're up to four weeks now, since the president intervened with an executive order that canceled half a trillion dollars in student debt, or at least intends to. Um, so, you know, as I said, I've been covering this space for a very long time. Um, it was maybe a decade ago when we started having conversations prompted by Democrats like Senator Warren, who are arguing that interest rates were too high on student loans. Um, I highlight that to, to illustrate how much the conversation has evolved in this relatively short period of time. At that time, I was yelling and Matt was yelling about how, in fact, you know, lowering interest rates on student loans would be a huge giveaway to rich borrowers, a hugely regressive intervention, and just preposterous to think that that would be something that our federal policy makers would use as an intervention to really fix this bit of a mess that has just been very well described. Fast forward to Democratic primaries leading up to the 2020 presidential election, and we saw a bit of an arms race amongst the Democratic candidates of who could propose the most aggressive cancellation policy 
It started with Senator Warren again. Bernie Sanders was actually second to the table with a loan cancellation proposal, which is, um, again, a bit surprising. Um, and then every other major candidate, um, including President Biden, had their own cancellation effort. President Biden's was the most modest, and it was my read of the situation, the fact that he was more of the camp that believed that this had been a regressive action and was not uh, excited to do it. Even statements he's made after the beginning of an administration made me believe that if he had had the ability to stop this from happening politically, he would have done so. So then we get to just uh, last month it was now when um, the White House did move ahead with an executive order that promises to cancel between ten dollars and $20,000 for borrowers at a cost of approximately half a trillion dollars, though I would argue that we don't even really know how much this is going to cost because I don't think that um, even the administration has done the analysis that's necessary to understand the implications of this really unprecedented and radical intervention. Um, following the news, um, I was as busy as I have ever been professionally, um, representing the center right of this conversation. Um, I was on NPR five times within that first week, which I think is telling. I'm not often the mainstream voice that is invited onto <laughs> NPR um, as a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, but on this issue, my voice, my arguments became a bit of the mainstream. Um, and I think that's an important thing to highlight in the conversation today, that there is agreement of, um, you know, on many points of the ideological spectrum, even if it's not universal, that the, the actions that have been taken so far by this White House are, are just going to be devastating to our system of higher education finance. Um, and I promised Neil, Neil McCluskey was on the previous panel, that it would offer some words in his defense. Um, you know, I've been following <laughs> Neil's work for a long time, and Neil has often held the position that we should be doing a, a lot less or perhaps nothing at all in the student lending space or higher education generally from a federal policy perspective. Um, and I, like what, you know, uh, was demonstrated in the first panel this morning, often dismiss Neil as being unrealistic or disconnected. I'm sorry, Neil. Um, this is my official apology. But I think in this moment, there is more support for Neil's positions than ever before. And I'm seeing a lot of Republicans, especially on the Hill, moving in the direction of believing that, you know, if we, c you know, there, there is an economic and a conservative rationale for intervention in the federal lending space, but if we are going to be so politically irresponsible that we can't maintain a system that works, then maybe, maybe Neil was right. Maybe, Neil, I'm not gonna give you all the way. <laughs> but anyway, I've overgone my time too, so I will pass along to Preston. <laughs> Thank Preston. you, Beth. This one. Oh, yep, that's on. All right. Thanks, thanks, Beth. That was a uh, very excellent remarks. And I have to say, I'm also leaning a bit more towards Neil position, Neil's position these days. You know, <laughs> you know that there's. I, I do believe that there is a uh, a legitimate market failure in the private market for student lending, but there also is a government failure when the government gets involved. And I think when we're at the point where we're forgiving $500 billion of student loans, doing a new income-based repayment plan that's probably going to cost an equivalent amount over the long term, so a trillion dollars in total, the government failure has gone way beyond what we think the market failure might be. And if you have the choice between a market failure and a government failure, the market failure doesn't look that bad anymore. But I want to take a little bit of a step back and talk about, well, what exactly do we believe the purpose of student lending is? And I believe that student loans are a tool for investment. You know, if the investment pays off, uh, you shouldn't need your loans forgiven. If uh, we do think that you need your loans forgiven, then something has gone seriously awry with uh, that investment, and it suggests that the uh, education that that student loan financed uh, probably wasn't really worth it. Um, and so when we talk about solutions to the student debt problem, we really need to be talking about ways to make sure that investment pays off for students. Uh, we talk a lot about undergraduates as the typical student borrower, but it's an actual fact that most student debt out there nowadays is associated with uh, graduate students and parents of undergraduates. As Diane mentioned, these are the folks who can borrow unlimited amounts. Uh, we've seen you know, increased enrollment in graduate education over the past decade. Enrollment in master's degree programs right now is surging, even as overall college enrollment is, fa is uh, falling. So when we talk about student debt, this is really you know, where the action is these days. Um, 
And I think a big, uh, big aspect of why uh, student loans have gone so off the rails is the fact that we do have unlimited loans for graduate students. And this is a relatively recent invention. You know that Grad Plus, the loan program which offers unlimited lending to graduate students, that only came about in 2006. You know, before that, if you're going to a high value but fairly expensive program like medical school or law school, you would probably uh, get education loans on the private market. And often those uh, education loans would come with a very reasonable interest rate. There was no market failure in private student lending for, for people at the graduate level. But then 2006 comes along, the government takes the cap off of uh, graduate loans, and you have, suddenly have this proliferation of low quality graduate programs. You, universities added about 9,000 new master's degree programs uh, since Grad Plus was introduced in 2006. And not all of these have been great. You know, there was a Wall Street Journal uh, expose last year that showed Columbia University, an Ivy League university, offers a master's degree in film where the cost that, uh, that students take on, the debt that students take on, is about $180,000 for the degree. And the median earnings that students get once they graduate are about $30,000. So you're borrowing about six times what you've earned. And these are the, uh, the kind of low value, low quality programs that uh, the unlimited graduate lending program makes possible. So I think at the very least, we should be going back to the 2006 caps on graduate student lending. I would be in favor of getting rid of the graduate student loan program entirely, but of course we can have that conversation. I think the private market would be in a good position to step in and pick up uh, the slack for good quality uh, graduate programs, uh, but bad quality programs such as that Columbia Film Program would probably find it uh, financially untenable to continue operating if you don't have access to those federal loans. So that leaves what to do with undergraduate loans. Now, there is more of an economic rationale for federal involvement in undergraduate loans than there is for graduates, but the government coming in can still cause big problems, as we've seen. So we really need to find a way to somehow align the incentives of colleges with the interests of students to make sure that if a college is offering a program with federal money, that program is going to leave students in a well enough uh, economic position in order to pay back their loans with interest and not uh, just push the cost on the taxpayers. So, you know, I, I believe that uh, the solution here is some form of risk sharing, basically the idea of holding colleges accountable for a certain portion of uh, students' unpaid loans. Um, I think that the, the colleges, if they are financially accountable for a portion of unpaid loans, uh, they're going to have three options. One is that they can lower the prices they're charging to become more in line with the economic value those degrees are offering. Number two, uh, they can uh, change the programs in order to emphasize more marketable skills so that students can get actual uh, good paying jobs after they graduate and won't just be uh, stuck with uh, $30,000 a year in uh, film jobs and $180,000 in debt. Um, or they can decide that those programs are just not financially viable um, if, uh, if the colleges are going to be on the hook for some of the uh, unpaid loans. And they can say, you know what, we're going to close these programs, we're going to reinvest our resources elsewhere, we're going to reinvest our resources into, uh, into programs that are actually providing a financial returns for students. Um, no matter which one of these paths they choose, uh, all of those paths will help ensure that students receive a return on investment uh, for their investment in education. And I do want to kind of underscore the urgency of reform here. Uh, you know, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget has estimated that uh, after President Biden forgives, uh, you know, up to $20,000 in student loans for, for all borrowers up to a certain income cutoff, it's going to take just five years for the outstanding stock of student debt to go back up to its current level. So in five years, we're going to be right back where we started, only there's going to be an extra trillion dollars on the national debt. And I'm thinking that that's going to create a lot of pressure for the next Democratic president to say, uh, finish the work that President Biden started and you know, forgive another round of student loans. I imagine that the next Democratic primary is going to uh, feature a lot of candidates trying to one-up each other with promises of new student loan forgiveness. But they, we may not even have to wait for that. You know, This new income-based repayment plan that uh, President Biden introduced as part of his uh, loan forgiveness proposal, um, estimates by Adam Looney, who's an economist at the Brookings Institution, show that the median bachelor's degree student is going to repay just about 50% of what they borrowed because the new terms of this income-based repayment plan 
are so generous. You know, whether it's forgiveness uh, outright or forgiveness through income-based repayment plans, you know, the federal student loan program right now is careening towards a fiscal cliff, and the party in power seems to have very little interest in actually fixing the issue going forward. So I would argue that this is an area where conservatives, you know, not only have an opportunity but a responsibility uh, to step up to the table and offer real solutions to fix this problem going forward and not just uh, forgive loans uh, every five years. Um, I'll leave it at that and hand it over to Matt. So I want to offer a limited defense of the student loan program uh, <laughs> by asking you to think about this question. So the loan program is a disaster in practice, but does it work in theory? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think Preston gave some good reasons, you know, why we have a loan program in the first place, that it does address a core market failure. I would add it also buys a lot of access, and there's always this question of access to what, right? Access to some pretty good things, and some pretty good opportunities for millions of Americans, but also access to dead end, to, to dead ends, to you know, debt with, with no degree. And it does so at a lower cost than grants, right? If we turn the loan program into a grant program, as you know, some of the recent policy changes you know, nudge us in that direction, that logic starts to fall apart, right? Then we're just running a backdoor grant program through a loan program, and clearly that would be a mistake. So I wonder if you know, student loans in a lot of ways are kind of like democracy, right? The worst way of doing things except for all the other ways of, uh, of doing things. Um, so I think it's worth thinking about how to, how to design this program and especially with that kind of the underlying principle of how to return it to its core original mission of addressing a very specific market failure. That there are people for whom opportunity is possible with additional money who would have the potential to pay it back in the future but to whom a private lender would not make a loan because they're too bad of a bet for the private lender but they're still a good bet for, the, for society uh, at large. So I think a big part of that is thinking not just about how the loans are repaid, which is, of course is important, but also how they're made in the first place. It seems like policymakers across the political spectrum agree that a lot of these loans should never have been made, should not be made. Um, and some folks, you know, once more on one side of the spectrum than the other, think we, that means we should forgive the debt. And so regardless of whether you think we should forgive the debt, it seems we should stop making loans to current and future students that we shouldn't have made to students in the past. So I think there's some potential bipartisan consensus there, but of course how to do that will be very tricky. And exhibit number one there really is, as, as Preston detailed in his comments, graduate borrowing. That's where the large balances are. You know, most undergraduates don't borrow more than about uh, $40,000. And these large graduate balances aren't you know, just some abstract issue. They really complicate sort of discussions about how to design the loan program. Because if everyone, if you only lent money for undergraduate and no one really borrowed more than 30, 40,000, you could have a much simpler design. You could have perhaps lower interest rates. You could have more generous income-based repayment plans and people would still pay it back because it's a relatively low amount of debt. Once you take this group of undergraduates for whom things could be simple and you throw in a lot of doctors and lawyers with one, you know, two, even $300,000 in debt, suddenly you have to worry about the subsidies that flow through the interest rates. You have to worry about designing income-based repayment in a way that doesn't reward people with incomes who you think are too high who should really, shouldn't benefit from that. So that could really simplify the uh, kind of policy design uh, considerations around this in addition to some of the benefits that, that Preston talked about. Um, but if policymakers were to reduce the amount students could borrow, both for graduate school, and I think there's also a case to do this for so the lower quality undergraduate programs where people just consistently don't get a good return on their investment and on, on the you know, taxpayer's investment, putting those limits in place would force some hard questions about whether and how to subsidize those programs so people without the means to pay directly can still attend them. And you know, Diane offered a very you know, poignant personal story of how this is a really hard, hard question. And there may well be some programs that we want to subsidize with grants, but we should make that decision consciously and not do it as a backdoor through a loan program with, with forgiveness for people who can figure that out. And perhaps there are other programs that just shouldn't exist because they don't offer enough value. Um, we have to be careful. There are some instances where the you know, government requires people to get degrees, like you know, teachers in many states are required to get master's degrees. So if we don't think those degrees are, you know, have value in the classroom, well, we could stop lending money for them, but we should also then stop requiring them. Um, and it's, this is also, it's, it, you know, it's easy to go back and say, well, we shouldn't have done X in 1980-whatever, 1990-whatever, but now that we've done it, these are bells that are very hard to, to unring, right? So if we think this has led to a run-up in, you know, say, over-credentialing in the labor market, that the master's degree is the new bachelor's degree, if that's true, then that puts us in kind of a challenging position. On, on one hand, we're paying for all these degrees we don't want to be paying for, but on the other hand, if we 
um, stop subsidizing them uh, to the degree that we are, there are some risks that, that a lot of folks could be harmed by that, in, including some of the more vulnerable folks in, in society. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't address it, we absolutely should, but we need to kind of be careful about that. And I want to make one final comment on kind of the repayment question. You know, I've been a little bit disappointed in how kind of policy has gone on this. It just seems like, you know, the old saying that, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, right? So at some point, policymakers seem to conclude the problem with income-based repayment, which is our main you know, safety net for student loans, is that the share of income paid was too high. It used to be, I think, 15 or 20 percent. So in the Obama administration, they did some legislation, some regulations to bring that down to 10 percent. Didn't solve the problem. People were still defaulting on their loans. So the current administration has now decided the problem was, you know, going from 20 to 10 percent didn't fix it. I guess we got to bring it from 10 percent to 5 percent, to a point where, you know, a lot of folks, including our undergraduates, you know, wouldn't even repay. You know, the average person, you know, would only repay as I think one of the panelists mentioned half their, half their debt. Um, so I, I think this is clear that changing that one parameter, the share of income paid, isn't going to address the core issue of people defaulting on their loans, and it's going to drive up the cost of the program, and it's going to direct a bunch of subsidies, you know, to people who probably. Uh, don't, don't need them. So I, so I think the real solution, you know, on income-based repayment is not about the share of income you pay, but on how it's administered. And, you know, the only countries, I think, where income-based repayment has really worked at large scale are countries like Australia and the United Kingdom, where you pay based on your income, but it's done automatically through the tax withholding system. So, right, if you lose your job, you don't go into default on your Social Security taxes, right? You've lost your job, you're not making money, you don't owe Social Security taxes. And so in Australia and the UK, that's how it works with your student loans. You lose your job, you don't go into fault in your student, on your student loans, you just stop paying them because they're, they're done through the payroll withholding system. And so I think absent a change like that, which you know, would be a significant step for the U.S., and I'm not sure there's at this point a lot of political appetite for it, you know, a absent that, I think continuing to try and have income-driven repayment be the solution is going to be a fool's errand, and it's just going to kind of lead us back where we were, except with lots more costs uh, for, uh, for taxpayers to bear. So look forward to the discussion. Great. So I'll throw a couple of questions out and while you're thinking of your questions, and then we'll turn it over to all of you. So Matt, you, you um, raised the issue of the Australia program. I've been a huge advocate of what is done in Australia, not just because repayment is, is tied to employment and payroll, which I agree is a difficult thing to do in this country, but I think the real benefit of the Australian program is that there's not really an interest. So what what we do in our program is we tell poor kids you're going to pay twice as much for college as rich kids because what the government does with interest I think is criminal. I say that with quotes. I mean it's not criminal because Congress told them to do it, but I think it's morally criminal what we do with interest rates and, and people pay a lot. And when students get buried, it's because interest capitalizes and then it capitalizes again and then they're told to go to graduate school so they put their loans you know, on hold and then they come out of hold and they realize they have $8,000 of interest that capitalized and so on. So people know how much they borrowed and then all of a sudden they owe tens of thousands of dollars more because they weren't keeping up with interest payments even though they were paying what the government told them. So I think interest is one of many problems. So I'm curious to know what the panelists think about a system like the one in Australia that says you're going to pay it back based on your ability and it'll take some of you longer than others, but we're not going to have an interest penalty. Everybody's going to pay a user fee, I think it's 25 percent, and if you pay it off quick, great. If you take longer, that's okay too. We're not going to further penalize you for taking longer. So, so you don't have a situation where people borrowed 100,000 and now owe 200,000. So my question is, you know, is dealing with the interest problem and the fact that we tell our lowest income borrowers that you're going to pay the most for college. Is that the core of the problem? And would that aspect of the Australian model help? Or is it just not possible in the U.S. to go in that direction? Beth, do you want to? Yeah. So, you know, this is a, a question that I've actually um, moved on recently. Um, you know, I, I used to argue the idea of eliminating interest on these loans is a terrible idea because it opens up an individual arbitrage opportunity. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, if I have the money in my bank account and I have the opportunity to either pay for college outright or borrow at a 0% interest rate, 
um, the, you know, the answer is clear, I'm going to borrow. And so it's kind of these implicit subsidies that encourages more borrowing than otherwise. So that's kind of like the textbook economic answer. Then in practice, you know, I've been listening to people upset about their student loans for a very long time. And when you listen carefully, a lot of what you hear is borrowers who have had their balances increase over time despite making on-time payments, um, and they're angry and hurt and upset. So it turns out humans aren't like those textbook actors that I learned about in graduate school. Um, and we may need to make a system that works with the behavioral aspects um, of you know, borrowing as much as the economic aspects. And I think one of the concessions may be that we need to have a system that doesn't have this, you know, the possibility for negative amortization, which is when borrowers are making on-time payments on their loans in the full amount that's due, but their balance is increasing over time. It turns out that that doesn't work for people. It works for economists, it doesn't work for people real people. <laughs> but what do you think about the idea of a user fee, right? So in Australia, yeah. everybody <clears throat> pays 25%. So it's kind of like interest, but it doesn't further penalize those who take longer to repay, and it avoids the moral hazard issue somewhat. What are your thoughts about that? You mean it's a one-time user As fee? As a one-time user fee. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's fine. Um, you know, I don't think it yeah, I mean, I think it, it mitigates the incentive for people to borrow when they don't need to. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, you know, it, people who are financially savvy and understand the time value of money will still be able to exploit the system for their gain. What's the cost of that? Maybe not, you know, sufficient to outweigh the benefit of eliminating the psychological burden of carrying interest for those less sophisticated borrowers. I think it's a reasonable approach. I mean, if we could, if I could snap my fingers and move to that system today over what we have, I would say let's do it. Does anybody else want to comment on that? I think this is an area where if you, this could make a lot of sense if you could rein in the unlimited borrow lending to mm -hmm. graduate students and parents, right? Mm -hmm. If I, as an affluent parent, you know, my children in college can borrow an unlimited amount of money interest-free, I'm going to take advantage like crazy of that arbitrage opportunity that Beth talked about. But if we could bring this program back to the core mission of, you know, lending primarily to undergraduates, maybe in limited cases for graduate school, and the balances aren't that high, then I absolutely agree. Having a complicated set of interest rates is just confusing and demoralizing to people. And most undergraduates aren't arbitraging, you know, borrowing at, you know, X percent to get a better spread in the private market. And so if you took interest rates to zero and then, as you said, have some kind of origination fee to cap, you know, to capture some of the costs of, you know, potential cost of defaults and, and non-repayment, and so people don't borrow just for no reason, mm -hmm. that that could be a reasonable way to do things. I'll just say, uh, I'll, ju I'll just say two general observations. The first is to echo some of the things other panels said. The data is a little stale now because people had, didn't have to pay their student loans for several years. So this is data from before the pandemic, but the data I saw was only 37% only of student loan borrowers are current and paying down their balances. So even if they're not in default, they're, they're not repaying their loans, right? 33% were current, but balances were increasing, probably because of income-based repayment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, negative AM, 13% were only paying the interest, 17%, according to this data, was in delinquent or default. So the reality is, this isn't a loan program, <laughs> right? That, that makes like the subprime market in 2008 look like, uh, you know, Lloyd's of London or something, right? 37% uh, 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 paying down, right? So to some extent, what Biden, what Biden administration do is pulling a little bit of rabbit out of a hat, which is they're turning what would be a huge loss into a political gain, right? Uh, by writing off all this debt that wasn't going to get paid anyway. So, so that's the first thing. We've essentially created We've essentially created a social welfare program, not a loan program. And the observation is if we want to have a social welfare program, we wouldn't design it this way and pretend like it was a loan, right? We do all kind of tricks to pretend like it is. The second thing is, is um, there's a larger question here, right? Which is, is education really just about economics? Um, if so, there's a bigger question here. We give huge subsidies to higher education. High, you know, universities own trillions of dollars of untaxed real estate, uh, for example. Right. Um, if we if all this is is about training people for the, for jobs, nobody in their right mind would set up a, uh, a job training system the way universities look today. 
right? The only justification for why we even have this whole network of subsidies and tax benefits and that sort of thing is because we think there's some public goods generated by higher education, such as people becoming better informed citizens or something like that. Um, and so there's this peculiarity now that we've turned what is a very bizarre system for training people for jobs uh, into basically being measured by, uh, by, by outcomes. And I'm not, I don't have an answer on that. I'm just saying there's a larger question on the table if we're thinking of this as purely an economic enterprise, then we probably should be reevaluating the whole network of subsidies and everything else that goes along with it, which is suggesting there's something more beyond just a human capital investment, which as we heard, can be perfectly well done in a private market if all it is is private returns from human capital investment. So if people want to start making their way to the microphone, I'll ask another question to take up the time while people are walking to the microphone. But um, um, so, so Todd, you talked about the, you know, three of the most popular solutions, and I agree, those are the most popular, and like every other solution, it has lots of unintended consequences. But what I don't hear people talk about is the role employers pay, right? play. So, you know, we love beating up on colleges. Probably nobody loves it better than I do, although I have worked at colleges and universities of all types. Um, but at the end of the day, the program and colleges may have put us in the position where there's a surplus of college graduates giving employers the ability to say you need a master's degree to serve coffee. I'm just going to use that example. We know that's not really characteristic of an entire employer and workforce, but in its extremes, we see employers demanding, including the federal government as an employer, demanding credentials that are far beyond what incumbent workers have and far beyond what wages would suggest. So, should employers have some responsibility in some of this payoff or payback or in guaranteeing salaries at a certain level. If you're an employer that's demanding a master's degree, do you have some responsibility to then offer a wage that would compensate for the cost of earning a graduate degree? So the question is, is there a role for employers? Do they have some liability in this? And if so, what would it be? I can uh, chip, chip in on that. So I totally agree that you know one of the big roots of this problem is, is credential inflation. The mm -hmm. fact that a job 30 years ago which did not require a college degree now does require a college degree. And I do think that employers you know, bear a big share of the responsibility uh, ability for that. But one of the biggest offenders in terms of credential inflation is the government itself. You know, for a job that pays, say, about $75,000 a year, uh, a, if that job is in the government, that job is much more likely to require a master's degree than a job in the private sector. You know, the inter when we talk about which employers are kind of leading the charge on slapping these unnecessary degree requirements onto, um, onto jobs, it's really the government. Um, and it happens through the licensing system, too. You know, we, um, like the District of Columbia, where we are right now, says it's going to start requiring college degrees for child care workers, which I don't think really makes any sense. <laughs> and so, you know, when we talk about opportunities for policy to fight credential inflation, um, I think we should start, you know, with our own uh, with our own backyard. We should start by looking at jobs in the state government, jobs in the federal government that require uh, degrees which are not necessary. Getting rid of those degree requirements, reviewing licensing requirements that might require education as part of the license, which might not necessarily be relevant to the skills that are required to do the job. I think that's where we can start. And uh, you know, if the government is able to. Uh, to, to do that it is able to start uh, dismantling some of these uh, degree requirements. I think that the private sector, to the extent that those uh, unnecessary requirements also exist in the private sector, the private sector will follow. Great. I want to turn, I, I, now that I'm looking over the podium, so I'd like to turn to the microphone if you'd like to ask a question of the panel. Sure. And, and I only came in halfway through, so uh, forgive me if you did address this in the first half. Um, and, 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 and could and you introduce just, yourself? Uh, my name's Inez Stedman. I work for Independent Women's Forum, one of the later panels. Um, my, my question is how you plan to solve the political problem associated with interest, because it seems like there are a lot of ways to, to, and you guys advance some interesting possibilities of how to do this so that people don't get buried by what is legitimately high interest. Um, the, 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 how do you plan to solve the political side of that problem, which is that both Republicans and Democrats rely on these loans theoretically on the books being in the black to pay for everything else that they want to pay for, when in reality, as Todd pointed out, you know, a third of people are actually making 
payments that progress on their balance. So like this is kind of a fake uh, money making program for the federal government and but now it's like tied into all this other stuff that both Republicans and Democrats want to do so it's very difficult because it means you'll get a negative budget score so how do you like plan on maneuvering around that? So if, if I can jump in and answer that so I was the Assistant Secretary of Education during the last reauthorization of the Higher Ed Act and I can tell you you are exactly right the student loan program is a bank to pay for other things. The score or the cost of changing interest rates um, is huge because the program is so huge. And what it basically asks is a politician to give up on some pet program in other, to, to pay for a program that already exists that they're not going to get a lot of lift from. So you're, you're exactly right. It is a political problem for both parties because if you change the interest rates, you got to find out how to pay for it because loss of revenue is a cost to the federal government. So I've thought about this a long time. And I, I think, you know, and I was back at, at the department during the Trump administration. I think the only way to solve that problem it's got to be off balance sheet. It's got to be a set aside agency that lives on its own capital, right? In other words, it can't any longer be the source of revenue to the treasury. It can't any longer be the source of revenue to pay for some other pet project. And by the way, like a real bank, federal student aid should have to pay its employees off of the, the work it does to actually collect on its loans because right now we have a bunch of people who would just be happy to forgive all the loans because it doesn't affect their income but if you're a real bank employee uh, you know collecting on those loans is important to you because it pays your salary so I, I don't know if that is politically possible but I think the only way we get out from under this is to have federal student aid as a separate entity you know run by bankers um, and that doesn't serve as the piggy bank for Congress. That's just one idea, but I'm sure others. So one silver lining of the expansion of the repayment programs over time is that very recently the CBO has revealed mm -hmm. that graduate student loans are no longer a source of revenue. They've become a costly program, which makes it politically easier to eliminate them because instead of having to, there'd be a trade-off, it actually creates more money to spend on something else. And so, parent loans are headed in that direction, yes, right? And parent loans have always been a huge money maker and not so much yeah, anymore. Yeah, so that, per, that opens a tremendous opportunity and eliminates a huge political barrier, as you've pointed out. And you could also tinker with the origination fees in the way Diane <clears throat> described, to do a trade-off there, where you increase the fee everyone pays and then you lower the interest rate. Mm -hmm. One What's other your, potential oh, unintended sorry. consequence of this is there's Two ways you can make a loan, right? You can either price the risk eff effectively. I don't know what the right interest rate would be for a student loan like this. I'm, I'm not sure that it wouldn't be higher uh, than we actually yeah, see, right? Take, uh, take into account of the risk. The other thing you could do is you become much more aggressive about collections, uh, which is you could reduce your loan, your, your, your loss rates by, you know, sending out, uh, you know, like by really being aggressive about collections. And so that's another possible unintended consequence of this or something to think about, which is, one way, you know, where, where does this lead if we start trying to do with this and they start becoming more aggressive about collections, so. So one of the, uh, as, as you've highlighted, one of the reasons that we have such high, the need for these big loans is because tuition is going up. And also, one of the other issues is, is that in many universities, uh, you have to, when you first go there for the first year or two, you have to live on campus. Number two, they then tie it to a food plan, which there's a you know bronze, silver, gold, and even the bronze forces you to buy more food than you can than you can ever eat. At least that was an experience with my, my daughter. And so I'm going. This is this is antitrust stuff. This is a, I can't believe they can require this. But since they're a governmental entity, most of them, you can't pursue that. So is there? But that is another aspect of the the need for these loans. So you can pay for this. Uh, is there any way that the, to regulate that, to say, no, you can't do this tying anymore. You can't tie your, your uh, dormitories to attendance. You can't tie your food plan to your dormitories. It's relatively few schools that require you to live on campus, and they tend to be more elite schools. And so I think, you know, honestly, making policy 
based on what happens at elite schools, probably, you know, serves a very small number of people. Um, you know, at most this public- is a state school. And I think and, it, but most of them, you have the option, you can live off campus, you can live in an apartment. So if there is a state school that says, no, you have to live on campus, then I put them in that category of, of elite institutions. Once upon a time, um, schools were not required to include into their cost of attendance housing and food. Congress was the one that, went, that, that legislated that the cost of attendance had to include food, cost of living and expenses. And so that was a change that now obligates schools to include those costs. And in some parts of the country, you're right, the dorm is twice as expensive as an apartment. In other parts of the country, it's the only affordable option. But it used to be the case that the cost of living was not necessarily included in the cost of attendance. It used to be the option of the institution whether or not to include that. There's been some policy discussion of should we standardize the uh, the way the government uh, has colleges calculate those living allowances? Right now, every college sets it. So some folks have done studies showing you can have colleges, and this difference doesn't cost a living, obviously, but you could have colleges across the street from each other setting vastly different allowances, mm -hmm. which sometimes can matter for provision of aid um, and loans, and especially say the limits in the in the parent lending program. So I think there's a strong case to be made that that should be a standardized formula, you know, based somewhat on cost of living in the area, but that's not just at the discretion of the college. Yeah, and I believe that the cost of living is estimated by colleges has gone up faster than inflation. So the colleges are saying the cost of living is going up faster than the cost of living, which doesn't make any sense. <laughs> well, and if you go to college campuses, their cost of living has gone up because their quality of life has gone up. I mean, you know, a lot of these, I, a lot of these kids in college live better than we do, right? I mean, so there are some colleges that, you know, it's, it's like being on a Disney cruise. Um, yes. Good morning. Uh, Valerie Maloney, I'm an attorney and I was, um, I was in the last administration, which is why I've probably come out with some strange ideas. I'm listening to you and I find the whole concept of student debt reprehensible. I, had, I, I went through GW Law School, no debt. My children went through college, no debt. There are other ways to do it other than just borrow, borrow, borrow. I mean, the majority of people in this country work and they do not have debt, student debt. But these poor kids who are borrowing, borrowing, borrowing will never be able to pay off their debts, will never pay off their, will never be able to afford homes. They will, they will limit the size of their families. And all for what? Why can't you be looking at how to educate people without putting shackles on people? Well, and I, I think the earlier panel made the comment, you know, we, we put all of our federal investment in college as opposed to apprenticeship. I mean, no, several no, no, of us no. have worked that's, on... That's not it. I mean, at no point in the, has this panel ever discussed community colleges as a cheaper way to do school or working it or being in the military. Get, um, no, there's no other way of doing it. I, I went to GW, but I did it at night. So I worked in the day and, and wrote a big check every semester. Um, there are other ways to do it, and I think for the morality, we should be looking at that because it's rotten. To, it's it's a fraud on the people who are out there working to then write off all the student debt. I, I have to respectfully disagree about the characterization of the state of borrowers, um, and and this is what a lot of my work has focused on. Matt and I co-authored a book highlighting this fact. The the narrative about student debt in this country would have you believe that every additional dollar in debt that a borrower takes on makes them worse off financially over the course of their lifetime. The reality and the data show that investments in college, even financed by borrowing, yields a higher lifetime income and wealth than the student would have access to otherwise. So for the vast majority of people who borrow, borrowing is a wealth enhancing activity. Just like we celebrate borrowing to, to enable home ownership, which is also an investment that we know yields in general huge returns, education debt on average for the typical student works in the same way. Data, the most recent data is to, from 2019 tells us that about people are spending about 4% of their monthly income on student loan repayment. If you look at expenditure data from households, that's about what people are spending on personal entertainment expenses. Going well, you, to the movies, paying you, mini golf. You look very concerned when you talk about that, and you brow furrows, but when you're talking about people getting no interest-free loans, that's, that's hilarious. 
And your friend, uh, my friend from uh, GW, uh, from Mason there, when I went through their um, college, when I sat with one of my kids to look at it, they were telling me, oh, you'll need five, six years to go through college. The fourth year does not do it. We should be insisting on people finishing in four years, finish on time. I mean, I, I think mean, we should be cutting deals with people who have student debt to, you know, pay 50% and be free of it and, and get on with your life. Um, the, the, and because every time you have a debt, you're going to need a bureaucrat to, to administer it. I, I think we also have to understand that when most of us in this room think about students in debt, we're thinking about 18 to 22 year olds. So a couple of things to keep in mind. Among students who borrow, who go, uh, among students who went to community colleges and borrowed, the average debt is about 14,000. So community college students, many of them don't borrow because some, some are traditional and their parents can pay. But among those who have to borrow, the average debt is around 14,000. So it's not like that's debt free. The other thing we have to keep in mind is, you know, the fastest growing part of the higher ed population or at least this was the case pre-COVID, maybe this has shifted, is you know, non-traditional students, not 18 to 22 year olds. We're talking about you know, single moms or people who are mid-career trying to go back. And you know, interestingly, there was an article in Forbes years ago that basically said if you're a single mom and you can't make $85,000 a year, don't work because it'll cost you too much, you get more on public benefit, you'd have to make 85,000 to come out even if you work. So when you're talking about lower income students, there are all kinds of issues about what do they do after college if they can't find childcare, if they can't afford childcare, if they can't get a job that pays 85,000, are they better off not working? So it, we have to remember, it's not all 18 to 22 year olds. There's a lot of, of complexity in the system. I just want to associate myself with uh, Beth's comments, which is the data look like for most people, investment in higher education, that human capital investment is a positive sum investment. The numbers get fuzzy because it turns out that the kind of people who are capable of succeeding in college also do better even if they don't go to college, right? right? So there's a question about to what degree is it signaling for or sorting for people who are conscientious and uh, smart versus higher education. But there's a clear correlation there. It appears that it increases it. It's a human capital investment, just like Beth said, like an investment in a house, car, anything else that's, a, uh, that's an investment. The overall impact of it seems to be, and I've got some data that's uh, in uh, the CFPB task force report, which is in the CLA materials. What the best data we have right now is if you think about home ownership for a while, is it appears, for, for instance, it appears that having student loan debt kind of delays um, when you become a homeowner and that sort of thing. By about the age of 30, though, um, people who graduate with college without student loans and those who graduate from college with student loans have the home ownership rates. So, and I think it has to do with what Beth was saying, is it, you, you pay it down, it's a bump on your balance sheet for a while, but eventually you catch up uh, and you, know, you turn out to start reaping the benefits of a higher education degree. I don't disagree with, with any of these comments, um, but I do think it's valuable to have this, this point that you know, debt shouldn't be how people finance higher education in the national conversation, because I think the conversation can be very confused. Right? You have mm -hmm. folks out there saying, we need to cancel all the debt. But they're not also out there saying, and we shouldn't have loans as how people pay for college. And I think that's a, it's a legitimate, mm -hmm. I think it's a defensible in some ways, it's not the point of view I hold, but I think mm -hmm. there's a defensible point of view to say, whether someone is a you know, low-income single mom at 30 or a student from a low-income family at 18, that we shouldn't be asking that person to sign up for this complex financial instrument to pay for college, and we should have a loan pro a grant program that's probably gonna be less generous than the loan program, but we're gonna take that trade off and we're gonna we're going to go in a different direction. I think that would be a more healthy conversation for us to be having nationally than this one where it's like, you know, well, one side is basically saying, you know, the food stinks, but the portions are too small. Yeah. Yeah. Re really quick. I, I definitely agree with the goal of, you know, reducing student debt overall. You know, I've cited a number of programs which probably should not exist. People shouldn't be taking on debt for them. For the programs that should exist, we should be looking at ways to lower tuition in order to make sure that students aren't taking on more debt. But 
I think that the idea of getting rid of student debt entirely just isn't going to work. For example, you know, most European countries that have free college still have student debt in some capacity mm -hmm. because, you know, it's very expensive to live in Europe and you probably have to take on loans for living expenses even if your tuition is paid for. Or maybe you're going to a program that isn't covered by free college or a graduate program or something. You know, student debt is probably all go always going to exist in some form and we should probably acknowledge that as a starting point of this conversation. And students stay in college for eight years in uh, Europe also because they don't have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting close to the end of our time, so we'll, these last two questions, we'll try to be quick with our response, and these are the last two questions that we'll take, so we'll start with you. Okay, well first, channeling the last speaker, I'm fine with the idea of student debt. As you say, for most people it's worthwhile and they're going to pay it off. We're only talking about marginal students, and I can tell you that finance has come a long way since when this program started many years ago, uh, private borrowers can very easily use the demographics to determine who's a good risk or not, and as the universities can. It has to do with things like what you did in high school and test scores. So then you have this group of people where I understand the thought that you want to give them a shot at having a college degree, but again, the psychological damage is just stunning in terms of luring people into uh, something that isn't going to work with them besides changing the sociology about the value of work if you don't have a college degree. I was just at AEI yesterday and Larry Summers was going on about this. So I didn't hear the first panel, but that should be brought up at every panel. Now on the community college issue, okay, that's the place where you can prove if you're marginal that you actually have an appetite for going through academics. And I know Northern Virginia College, Community College is only like $2,000 a year. I mean, anyone could do it with a, a little bit of work while they were in for the degree at the end of two years, then you can transfer to a four-year program. I mean, it's, I don't know where the $14,000 came in. Because many of those students have to borrow for living expenses. All right, so go more of a part-time approach. I mean, if you really want to do it, it I'm not against all loans, but it does seem to me it's a good training ground. And this is only going to be covering people, I think, who don't have the track record in high school and college to be a test scores, et cetera, to be qualifying for traditional borrowing. It doesn't, it seems to me that is a fairly reasonable trade-off in the society to not be really hurting people that shouldn't be doing this in the first place, but at the same time giving a giving people a chance. Yeah, I agree. I mean, right now, 97% of private student loans have a credit-worthy co-signer. So I know that private lending is the darling of conservatives, but I can tell you from my own experience and from the data, uh, the people who need them most aren't going to get them um, because they don't have a credit-worthy co-signer or a parent who's even willing to think about it. So there's the challenge there. I think you raise a good point. So when you talk about uh, political challenges, I know I, I've lost where you went, the, who, the person who asked the question about political challenges. Um, the real question, and I get to say this because I'm retired, if I was still working, I would not get to ask this question. Should we have open enrollment institutions and should the federal government support people to attend them or is it the responsibility of states to take care of people who don't who need remedial education because that probably means the high school didn't do a good job. So the, the, the political third rail is, should we allow the federal government to support students at open enrollment institutions? I've worked at a community college. I've seen both sides of the issue. This is a really tough one. Um, it is the political third rail, but it kind of is the source of a lot of the defaults and debt. You know, people who give it a try and realize it's not That's for right. them. Um, but then the completion agenda tells them, but you got to complete. So, it, you, you know, I, I think you raise good points, and that is the important question that I don't know any politician will ever take on. I'll just add to that. We, we really, please do not believe that community colleges are good. Um, 
Northern Virginia Community College is not a normal community college. Most community colleges in this country are a disaster. The reason we have a for-profit education sector is because a lot of those kids tried to do community college. They were such a disaster uh, that they, they, they are really terrible. Uh, the completion rates are low. The default rates are low. The education is terrible. The worst possible thing we could do is give free community college to everybody for the reasons Diane suggests. In addition, that would simply accelerate the important points about credentialism that uh, my colleagues have mentioned, which is the easier you make it to get more credentials, the more, the less valuable each of those credentials uh, uh, happen. When you subsidize community college, a high school degree becomes less valuable, right? Uh, if you subsidize, and then you know, it just kind of goes up from there. So, um, so please, please. Community colleges are not the answer. I'll leave it there. And, and, I, I, and I'll, I'll close by saying that um, policy discussions are very difficult on this topic. And what I oftentimes say when we start these conversations is, but what do you want for your child? Because we have a lot of people who make lots of recommendations knowing that they can afford for their child to do whatever they want. And so you always have to ask you know, do you want it for your child? And I remember years ago, I, I'm a huge advocate for apprenticeship programs. I did an apprenticeship and somebody said, but yeah, but would you want your kid to do it? And the answer is yes. My youngest son did an apprenticeship, hated college, did one year, hated, did an apprenticeship. And I will tell you, it was harder for him to find and get into an apprenticeship than it was for him to get into a selective college. So always, you always have to look at these conversations from not other people's kids, but is this an answer you'd want for your child? Um, and that's you know, a good guidance in thinking about solutions. Can everybody give me a hand, uh, 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 join me in giving a hand to the panel, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And just a, uh, a quick announcement, uh, if everybody can go out those doors uh, and then turn left in the room behind me, uh, the lunch uh, is going to be held. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>